13. I want to make sure everyone has their notes available. And uh, using those, I mentioned to you over and over again how important it is, I believe, for us to be taking notes and to understand what is going on and what is happening. John chapter number 13. Let's jump right in verse number 11. John chapter 13, verse number 11. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you. You call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Interestingly enough, Something we have not quite yet alluded to is the fact that it is possible that the Lord Jesus Christ is discussing two separate things at the same time. We speak of this cleansing. We speak of this cleansing that is taking place, this cleansing that is going on, and we speak of what is taking place in this passage but the truth of the matter is, we talked a great deal about this idea and this understanding as to whether or not this is a physical cleaning, if you will. We joked about it way far back, and uh, my uh, clicker is liking to click its own self. But anyway, uh, it's kind of like a teenager. It likes to do its own thing. <laughs> May I welcome to you a teenager. What should we call it? Maybe we should just call it it. It, this is the teenager it that does weird things in the night. But anyway, I digress. So the lesson is on cleansing. As we speak of cleansing, are we speaking of a physical thing that Jesus is doing? We talked a great deal about it when we first launched into this topic and this study. We talked about physical cleaning, like, like cleaning, taking showers, brushing your teeth. We took a little lighthearted approach. And then we talked about uh, when we look at this passage, is that what Jesus is talking about? Of course, we have to come to the conclusion that that is what Jesus is talking about because it was a physical act that Jesus was engaged in. He was actually physically washing the feet of the disciples. But I want to entertain tonight the thought and ask the simple question, is it possible that Jesus not only was discussing the physical act of cleansing, but also maybe he was talking about something else? Maybe as Jesus was teaching and maybe as Jesus was discussing, maybe, just maybe, Jesus was discussing two separate things at the same time. Maybe the sermon, if you will, the illustration that he was giving was something that needed to be done, but it was also alluding, if you will, to something even greater. Maybe something even more important. You say, Pastor Rich, is there something that is more important than physically cleansing ourselves? Oh, I'm sure there is. When we look at this passage, we find that so much is going on. Our God is a holy God. We catch a glimpse in this particular passage of His purity. We must learn to acknowledge our own sinfulness when we see this. We spent a great deal of time speaking of Isaiah and what he saw on that special time uh, when the posts of the doors were moved and the voice spoke and all of those things happened. And what did we say? The most important part of that particular story is the fact that when Isaiah saw all this, it helped him to see how much he needed Christ. How sinful he truly was. How much he needed a quote-unquote 
cleansing. Why? Because he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw him high and lifted up. He saw who Jesus was. And as he saw who Jesus was, it helped him more so than ever to begin to understand how not so high and lifted up he personally was. And how much he needed the Lord Jesus Christ. We use several passages of Scripture. We talk about that voice and the golden candlesticks in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, we talked about that person being called holy, uh, holy in 1 Peter chapter number 1. And we see so much of this willingness, this understanding of what Jesus is. And in this particular lesson, in the Gospel of John, we discussed the events of the life of Peter, which demonstrated his personal need to be cleansed. But watch this. Not only was he needing to be cleansed physically because of the sandals and the dust of the day, but he also needed a spiritual cleansing. Now would lead us to an understanding that Jesus was actually speaking of two separate things. As the custom of the day was, Jesus understood the disciples truly needed their feet physically to be washed. He needed to wash the sand and the dust off of their feet. But there was much more to the object lesson, if you will. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ was trying to help them as now to see that they needed a spiritual cleansing. Not only did their feet burn dirty and need to be cleansed, but now they needed to understand that their spirit, their life, their, their, their soul, everything in them needed a cleansing. And Jesus wanted to help them with that. In fact, that leads us to our first point, our first thought. This is your big number one in your notes, the ministration. What is that? The act of ministering care or aid or religious services as the dictionary describes it to us. But it basically helps us to see, if you will, the vehicle by which Jesus is choosing to deliver this spiritual cleansing. There is a ministry about it. There is a ministration about it. And from this passage, we see a number of tremendous lessons that are applicable to believers today. While the thrust of this particular thought is cleansing, there is much to be learned when we begin to see Jesus high and lifted up. And we begin to see how we are not so high and lifted up. And we need Him to help us to be what we're supposed to be. The more we look at it, the more we we begin to see letter A, Christ's heart. We begin to see the heart of Christ. Make sure you have it in your notes. Christ's heart. Heart, excuse me. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. So much to be said. So much to understand. The more we study, not only do we see more about the heart of Christ, but we also see the humility of Christ. The humility of Christ. It is almost incomprehensible to realize that the Son of God, the Lord of the universe, was willing to lay aside his garment, clothe himself in a towel so that he could kneel before the disciples and wash their feet. Imagine the fact that we understand today that he is the creator of the universe and understanding that position, understanding that power, imagine if we had the opportunity to allow him to humble himself, kneel before us, and wash our feet. We took on the opposite approach, the opposite understanding. Many times we scold Peter. Many times we preach at Peter. Many times we use Peter as a great object lesson, if you will, to teach us what we should not be doing. But the truth of the matter is, we begin to understand the humility of Christ and what it meant for Him to lay aside all that He was simply so that He could wash the feet of the disciples if you were to put yourself in their position. If you were to put yourself in the place of the disciples, how would you respond? I venture to say many of us would respond much like Peter did, questioning, are you serious? 
Do you want to wash my feet? Me, of all people? Do you want to wash my feet? The humility of Christ, the heart of Christ. It brings us to our second big point, and that is the misunderstanding. The misunderstanding is often that Peter finds himself in this position in the Scripture, a position of misunderstanding, not completely grasping everything that needs to be gotten from any particular situation. It is still and yet again the case for Peter that he is in this situation, in this awesome moment, and yet he misunderstands. He doesn't quite get it. He doesn't quite understand The misunderstanding is apparent. Peter is asking questions. This education of this disciple is long in its process as he was often prone to do. He once again spoke without thinking and contradicted the Lord. Surely, surely we said, surely he knew better. But yet he did. And yet the more we think, the more we begin to understand then maybe we would have done the exact same thing. Have been given the same opportunities, have been placed in the same position. We as Christians today quite possibly would have responded the exact same way to question. I wonder if other great people throughout the scripture, maybe even Isaiah himself, had been put in the same position. Wonder if Isaiah may have even questioned. As he began to see how high and lifted up Jesus was, as he began to see how lowly he was, as he began to see his need of that Savior and the importance of what Jesus was and what he was doing, wonder if perhaps he would question. There are a lot of ifs out there. Not a lot of wonder out there. Wonder if this were to take place. Wonder if this would have happened. It leads us to our next thought. Letter A, Peter's incredulity. Incredulity. When we look at Peter, we look at an individual who struggled with a problem that he personally had, but he wasn't the only one. And that idea and this word that we discussed last week is a word that simply leads us to understand that Peter was very skeptical in his nature. The more we begin to think about that, the more we may say it's quite possible. No, it is very probable that we today would have responded the same way. Why? Because we live in a skeptical world. We live in a world today where we are skeptics. We are skeptical of all that is going on. And Peter was actually exercising the same ideas that we have as Christians today, where he was skeptical of what was happening, not completely understanding. And he said, look, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus said, yes. And he said, no. And Jesus said, I have to. And Peter said, well, if you have to, then wash my hands, wash my feet, wash everything. Again, we see the misunderstanding. What I do thou knowest not now, Jesus said in verse 7, that thou shalt know hereafter. It's interesting because there are some things that the Scripture alludes to, uh, but yet never alludes to the fact that we will understand it, that we will know it. We often talk, maybe when we get to heaven, we'll be able to fill in all the blanks. We'll be able to understand certain things. And the truth being, from the Scripture, we understand more so than ever some things we will never understand. Right. Tragically enough, and sad to say, but some problems are not made for solving. Some issues we face, we will never know why. The song reminds us we'll understand it better by and by. But we may never understand it fully. In this particular passage of Scripture, though, Jesus says, you know what? You don't know what's going on now, but you will know. You don't understand it right now, but you will understand it later. 
You know, there's some things that we have to do, and people call it blind faith, but the truth being, it's not always completely blind. Lots of times, Jesus will allow us to see glimpses of what needs to take place and what is supposed to be happening. The truth being, we struggle to exercise our faith. We know we're supposed to be doing things. We know we're supposed to be engaging in things. We know we're supposed to be making decisions and pushing in a particular direction, going the, th the way that God would have us to go in. But we see it from an earthly perspective. And oftentimes, Brother Henry, when we look from that earthly vantage point, we can't see everything that's out there. We talked about the illustration of an airplane. You can see the same, in the same area from the sky. All of those miles up. All of the, the, that distance above the ground. And you can look over the ground and what happens? Your perspective is much different and you begin to see things differently. You know what? When we're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, our perspective is a little different. When we begin to look and we begin to see things through the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, we begin to see things a little more differently, if you will. We may see them from the earth. We may look here from where we stand. We may see it from our path and where we walk on a daily basis. But the truth be known, we are not seeing it as God sees it because we are not willing to exercise our faith. The Lord Jesus Christ gives us a measure of faith. God in heaven expects you to use that faith, to exercise that faith, to put that faith in Him, to trust Him to know the way. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. You want to sing? Let's sing it. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have that tonight. 
Well, I've read that passage several time, times. Peter said, Thou shalt never wash my feet. A declarative statement, literally. One can imagine Peter turning away and trying to avoid the Lord again, as we saw when Jesus told Peter about his upcoming death. From Matthew chapter 16, Peter's attitude was the same. This is not how it should be. Put yourself in his shoes. What is happening here is not what is supposed to take place. Jesus is not supposed to die. I'm not going to allow that to happen. From Matthew chapter 16. John chapter number 13. The Lord is not supposed to wash my feet. Put yourself in Peter's position. Put yourself where Peter is. Our natural reaction might be to wonder how could he do that? Why would he directly tell the Lord no? But a better question would be why are we personally trying to avoid what the Lord wants for us? Rather than criticizing Peter, rather than casting down Peter, rather than pronouncing judgment upon Peter, how about we lift Peter up and say, hey, Peter struggled with some things, but let me look at myself and let me do some self-introspection. Let me see what I'm doing and let me see how often I question what God is doing in my life. Peter simply questioned a command from the Lord, the same thing we do. And we do it too often, tragically enough. Go out into the highways and hedges, the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us to be kind under all circumstances. The Bible tells us that we're to follow His teaching. How often do we tell the Lord no? How often do we refuse to do what the Lord would have us to do? Isaiah 30, verse 15, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning... And rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And you would not. Jeremiah 29, 19. Because they have not hearkened to my word, saith the Lord, which I sent unto them by my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them. But you would not hear, saith the Lord. Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killeth the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So often, the doctor tells us we must do this. We must get more exercise. We must eat more healthy foods. We must do this or that or the other, etc., etc., or else. We're often willing to follow the doctor's advice simply because of the or else. But how often do we struggle to follow the commandments of God? How often do we follow or how often do we struggle to follow the commands of Christ? He wants so much for us, but we struggle. We struggle. To obey him. The impertinence of Peter. Let's look at another thought. Peter's impetuosity. Impetuosity. Peter's reply was impetuous. In other words, it was hasty. It hadn't been given careful consideration. I'll not, for the sake of embarrassment, ask you to raise your hand if you find yourself in this position that Peter often found himself in. <laughs> Having not given it proper thought, why did you make that mistake? Well, I really didn't even think about it. I didn't pay much attention. I was impetuous. Hasty. In a hurry. Not willing to fully understand the guidance of God and the Scripture. Not, not willing to understand what Christ was trying to teach. He said, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. After Peter began to think about it, Peter said, okay, then my hand's in my head. Peter's approach to life sometimes reminds us of a pendulum. It begins over here, and it makes that long sweep of the area, and then it ends over here. There's never a middle ground. It's either way up here or way up here. How are we doing as Christians? 
How are we living our lives? Proverbs 29, 11, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. What does that mean? Simply this. He thinks about it. He takes time to mull it over. Ecclesiastes 5, 2, Be not rash with thy mouth. Oh my goodness. That should be many people's life verse, especially our teenagers. Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thy heart be hasty to utter, to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. James 1.19 Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Jesus only desired to wash Peter's feet. Having first believed this was wrong, now Peter thought it through and understands a little bit of what he should be engaging in. We understand that all of God's Word is true and nothing should be taken away from it. Nothing should be added to it. Nothing should be diminished within the Scripture. But in our zeal, we sometimes take God's Word farther than the author himself does. And this is equally wrong. Be careful not to be guilty of this. The scribes and the Pharisees were especially notorious for this. In Matthew 23, the Bible reminds us, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid, ye observed, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Listen to that. They say and do not. Verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be bore and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Revelation 22, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Listen carefully. One illustration and we'll be done. In contrast to the two commands of Christ, the Pharisees had developed a system, watch this, of 613 laws. 365 negative commands and 248 positive laws. By the time Christ came, it had been produced a heartless, cold, and arrogant brand of righteousness. As such, it contained at least ten tragic flaws. Let's go through these. Number one, new laws continually needed to be invented for new situations. Sound like the country you live in? Number two, accountability to God was replaced by accountability to men. Sound like the country you live in? Number three, it reduced a person's ability to personally discern. Does that sound like the country you live in? Number four, it created a judgmental spirit. <clears throat> Does that? Do I need to say that after? Number five, the Pharisees confused personal preferences with divine law. Does that sound like the country you live in? Number six, it produced inconsistencies. Now that would never sound like the country we live in. <laughs> Number seven, it created a false standard of righteousness. Number eight, it became a burden to the Jews. The law, this law that they had set, it became a burden to the Jews. Number nine, it was strictly external. That's how like the country you live in. It was strictly external. Lastly, but not least, number ten, it was rejected by Christ. Does that sound like the country you live in? 
I'm here to say this, and I don't say this to any of their faces, if they would give me the opportunity, the privilege to do so. The so-called lawmakers who sit in that great house in Washington, D.C. are nothing more than a joke. Nothing more than a joke. I saw the percentage, I forget the number, I should have jotted it down, but I didn't intend to mention it tonight. I saw the percentage of the actual money in the coronavirus bailout that is actually going to help American citizens. And it was a joke. L O. I literally busted out laughing. This should not be called coronavirus bailout. It should be called the everybody else bailout. And oh, let me give a token to the American people who pay all the taxes, who pay all the money. You see, these laws were laws that were rejected by Christ. When we look at these 248 positive laws, these 365 negative commands, these 613 laws, we see that by the time Christ came, they had produced such a spirit of an arrogant brand of righteousness, that haughtiness that says that they were better. Do you remember the story of the two people that were praying one of them was a Pharisee. The other was a common, simple man who struggled to even lift his head up to heaven because he knew that he wasn't worthy to even ask Christ for forgiveness. Humility. It's interesting as we look and as we see this, this, uh, this point that we have with Peter and, and what Peter is experiencing at this point in his life and what he is struggling with and, and how he is so quick to respond so hastily but yet not fully understanding. May I say to you tonight these are the laws of God. This is the book that Christ hath ordained. This is what God wants for us. Hebrews 10, the Bible says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. Do you see that? But this man, after... He had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. It's important to see, I got a lot of verses, I'll give them to you briefly, but we won't read the actual verses, so hold time on that, have your pens ready. It's important to see that as we studied early on, cleansing was important to Christ. And it was a physical body is dirty it needs to be cleansed it was a physical cleansing daily cleansing oftentimes as we told you culturally speaking every time people would enter into someone's house they would be washed as soon as they entered the house but that is not the only thing that Christ is talking about there needed to be a spiritual cleansing there needed to be a cleansing of, of the heart, a cleansing of the mind. But watch this, watch this. When we talk of that spiritual cleansing, it wasn't a daily cleansing. It was a one time. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the debt of sin for each and every one of us, and He did that once. Right. Salvation, once. Trusting Christ as your personal Savior once. Cleansing and confessing your sin. Obviously that's something that needs to be done more often. But asking the Lord to come into your heart is done one time. The Bible literally says that Jesus died to pay the sin debt. He did it once. And after it was completed, He sat down at the right hand of God. Let's look at these verses quickly. 1 John 1. Jot it down. 1 
1 John 1, 8 and 9, very familiar. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jot these references down, Psalm 34, 18. Psalm 34, 18. Psalm 51, 17. Psalm 51, 17. Isaiah 57, 15. Isaiah 57, 15. It's important for us to see that we must become, we must come before the Lord daily, asking His forgiveness, asking Him to cleanse us, because we sin on a daily basis. We let the Lord down on a daily basis. We struggle on a daily basis. I wish, Sabrina, that we could say we trusted Christ one time and then we were saved and we didn't have to make any more decisions. From that point on, we only did good things. That's not the way it is. I wish it was. Salvation once, trusting Christ as our personal Savior one time, that is all that is necessary. However, we must come daily before the throne of God, requesting His forgiveness. Why? Because we messed up again. Why? Because we let him down again. Why? Because we refuse to do what he asks us to do again. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for the